Good morning, Emmanuel. Uh, words completely fail me, so I won't even try to describe just what the last 12 years have meant to be a part of this body. So let's pray, and I will try to compose myself. Lord, your word teaches that the devil is prowling around seeking some to devour. As we now take up the sword of the Spirit, your holy word, Lord, would we beat back those temptations in our own lives? Would we call him to flee? Would we, by the Spirit, with the one who is greater in us than he who is in the world, would we stand firm and we would we look on that which is pure and beautiful and delight in that and see the temptations of the world for what they are, that which will kill us? Protect us all and keep us to the end, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So our good God, when he made this world, he gave it an order. He established a fixed way that this world operates. And this includes what we will call uh, oftentimes the natural order. So for example, if you put seed in the ground during the warmer months and water it and give it adequate light, it's going to grow. And if you try to do that during the winter months, nothing's going to happen. Or to give another example, with enough friction, fuel, and oxygen, you can produce a fire. But water will extinguish it. It's just the way things work. Sea creatures have gills and can breathe underwater, but can't breathe on the land, and vice versa. If you put your hand in a fire, you get burnt. This fixed order, this way the things work, is actually called in Proverbs, God's wisdom. And Proverbs 8 actually describes this wisdom, saying it was God's first act of creation, meaning that every single thing that he created afterwards accords with, aligns with, and fits with this divine order. And this escapable fixed order of the world in which we lived, it includes, in addition to the natural order, what could be called a moral order. So just as there is a natural consequence of putting your hand in a fire, there are inescapable moral consequences to our actions because God's fixed order, which is called wisdom that is established in the world. Proverbs teaches that those who steal will get caught in their own trap. Those that are lazy will end up broke. And those that let loose their anger will open up the door to all other kinds of sin. This is just the way the world works, and you know it. You've experienced that. Whether you're young or old, rich or poor, live in the suburbs of America or the slums of India. And what I've been calling the natural and moral order, they're not purely distinct. It would be better simply just to speak of God's wisdom, this order which he created as his first act of creation, including natural and moral elements. So for example, Paul speaks of the sinful sexual relationships that men and women engage in as being, what, contrary to nature. They're sinful, but they're also against nature. Sin's not just wrong or a transgression of God's law, but it's a transgression of God's wisdom, a transgression of this fixed divine order of the way the world works. And this fixed order established by God has inescapable natural and moral limitations and implications. And this is where the rubber hits the road, right? Our sinful nature hits limits. We don't like being told what we can and can't do. We all know there's a natural order, and whether we like it or not, we must breathe oxygen or you're going to die. You can't say, that's oppressive. I choose the right to which gas I will inhale. Such injustice, my body, my choice, and I want to breathe carbon monoxide. Let's see how that works out for you. And yet, we do the very same thing when it comes to our morality. We think we can lie, steal, gossip, and avoid the consequences that God has established in this world that will happen. A rebellious and sinful nature wants to rebel against God's fixed order of wisdom. Our culture and our flesh demands the right to engage in all kinds of sinful acts, assuming that we know what's best for human flourishing. 
particularly today when we think about the Bible's teaching on sexual relationships, we think it's, or we hear at least, it's outdated. It's antiquated. We can create new ways for our life. We're progressive. We know the ways to flourish, new ways to date, new ways to do marriage. And in doing this, we ignore God's eternal and good wisdom that he's established for our good and for our flourishing and will end up ruining our lives. So the major teaching of Proverbs is that those who find out this wisdom, they discern God's established order in the world, the way things work, and they align their life with it. They're called the wise, and they flourish. Proverbs regularly speaks of our life and the decisions that we make as walking along a path. The way God made this world, he called it very good. And if we align our own lives with the grain of the universe, Proverbs states that our paths will be paths of pleasantness and ultimately paths that lead to life. But there's an alternative path, a man-made path, a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way to death, Proverbs 14 12. There's a way that seems right to man, but it will lead you to death. And there's a way that God has made it, the path of life, the path of righteousness, and it leads to life. We're told today, though, everyone's to chart their own path to happiness, express your own uniqueness and your individuality, live out your truth. But Proverbs reminds us plainly that such people are simply bucking against the order of the universe and like the person who chooses to express their individuality by breathing carbon monoxide or to be sexually promiscuous, both are destined to run into the reality of God's natural moral order sooner or later and meet a sorry end. Now, a couple of qualifications. Proverbs is proverbial, right? It's speaking of the general pattern of this world. And so you may be aligning your life as best you can with God's path of righteousness. And you might say this morning, Johnny, I just don't feel like my path is a path of pleasantness. There's difficulty in my life. There's hardship. Well, Proverbs doesn't really address that, but the fuller picture of the Bible would talk about God sends difficulties into our lives for our good to cause us to press on and to grow in holiness and to keep us to the end. But as a general rule, Proverbs does say that walking in the way of the Lord is pleasant. Even if your external circumstances are difficult, these paths are still pleasant. Because when you walk in the paths of wisdom, you can be described just as Noah and Enoch, as somebody who walks with God. And so your path is pleasant because whatever externally is happening, you are walking with the Lord. Another uh, caveat I want to give is that the timing of these consequences, this, the, the, the consequences that will come about because of this fixed order, they vary. So if you go outside, children, in freezing temperatures, and you ignore the calls of wisdom called your mother, who says, put on a coat or you'll freeze to death, you might freeze to death. It will get, you'll feel that really quickly. She was right. I should have listened. If you skip a few meals, your belly will let you know that something is going wrong. Natural consequences in this fixed order often take effect fast, but you might be stealing from your job or cheating on your spouse and no one's caught you. Yet. This is where Ecclesiastes, I love this verse, the Lord brought it to me when I was a new believer, verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 11, is so helpful. It says, because, like, wh- like, like if you keep sticking your hand in a fire, you should stop that because you keep feeling the consequence. But why do people go on sinning? One reason, Ecclesiastes tells us, is because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, so the heart of children of man is set fully to do evil. In other words, because you didn't get caught, because you didn't feel the consequence right away, you think you beat the system. Well, let me just let you know, you can't beat God's system. This order of wisdom that's fixed in the world will come back to get you sooner or later. So the consequence, the moral consequence of your actions that you will experience, the timing of it may vary, but you will get caught, you will get found out, you will eat the fruit of your way. It's just a matter of when. And then last uh, caveat, it may sound like Proverbs is teaching that if you just align yourself with God's way, you'll go to heaven. You'll get on the path of life. And if you don't align yourself with God's way, you'll be on the path to death, the path 
to judgment and hell. So all you have to do is find out the right things to do and you can go do them. This is where Ryan reminded us last week in Proverbs chapter one, what's the beginning of wisdom? The fear of the Lord. You can't fear the Lord if you are not born again, if he has not opened your ears to hear his word and his eyes, your eyes to see his beauty. This is what we would call in more familiar language that God has caused us to be born again by his spirit. All people in this world are born sinners. They don't hear and obey God's wisdom, and so they continue to sin, blaming other people for their problems. So it's not until God, uh, as a gift, causes that person to be born again that they will hear and obey the calls of wisdom. Let me add uh, an implication of that. What we're going to deal with in Proverbs today is commands. Do this and don't do that. And sometimes as Christians, we say, well, that's not very gospel-centered. I've been forgiven. But what does Romans 6 say? Should we go on sinning that grace may abound? Yes, you've been forgiven, but you've also been set free. Set free from that old master that would tell you to go on sinning. I often like to think of sin, and we will all still sin until we get to see Jesus face to face, but sin is like a redeemed Israelite, set free from Egypt, walking in the wilderness, set free from that oppressive slave master that day after day said, make more bricks, make more bricks, make more bricks, and they had no option but to do as their old master said. That master is gone, set free. And the Israelite wakes up and he's like running around trying to find straw and make bricks. And he's like, and the other Israelite says, what are you doing? Well, I got to make bricks, right? That's what, you've been set free. You don't have to obey that master anymore. So when you hear the commands of Proverbs today, I want you to realize that you have truly been set free. And if you're so gospel centered that you can't receive a command or call something stupid, you're not very, your gospel centeredness isn't very biblical. Proverbs call certain actions foolish and stupid and unwise. So turn in your Bibles as we look this morning at the sin of adultery and how we can guard ourselves from it. Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs chapter 5 teaches us how to follow this path of wisdom and so flourish in marital faithfulness. To follow the path of wisdom and flourish in marital faithfulness. Or simply stated negatively, how to avoid adultery. In this passage, a father teaches his son how to stay on the path of faithfulness to his spouse and how to avoid the snares and temptations of adultery which will ruin his life. Proverbs chapter five, verse one. My son, be attentive to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding that you may keep discretion and your lips may guard knowledge. For the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil, but in the end she's as bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword, and her feet go down to death. Her steps follow the paths to Sheol. She doesn't ponder the path of life. Her ways wander. She does not know it. And now, sons, listen to me. Do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her. Do not go near the door of her house, lest you give your honor to others and your years to the merciless. Lest strangers take their fill of your strength and your labors go to the house of a foreigner and at the end of your life you groan when your flesh and body are consumed. And how you say, how I hated discipline and my heart despised reproof. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to my instructors. I am at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation. Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets? Let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? 
For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he is held fast in the cords of his sin, and he dies for a lack of discipline. And because of his great folly, he is led astray. So I have three points. And the first one this morning, the first way to follow wisdom and flourish in marital faithfulness is to consider the end of your actions. Consider the end of your actions. Some passages in Scripture are difficult, right? They contain these complex theological ideas, big words that you need a dictionary to understand, and most of the sermon is spent unpacking these concepts and then applying it to your life. Today's different. There's nothing difficult theologically in this passage to grasp. The message is simple. Committing adultery will utterly destroy your life in devastating, comprehensive, and long-lasting ways. I don't think anybody in here is like, oh, I've never thought of that before. I I think you all would agree with that. And yet, many of you in here are also presently playing with fire, being fools, doing things today that if you don't repent of sooner or later, you will be in bed with someone other than your spouse. Just as the person who repeatedly sticks his hand in the fire thinking, this time's going to be different, or I know fire affects other people this way, but I'm different. So is the fool who thinks, I know adultery has ruined thousands of lives. I know people. They're in my mind right now. Taking down the wealthy and the poor, taking down Christians and even pastors. But I'm different. Playing with this fire, man, it's going to be different in my case. I can handle it. You're rejecting the wisdom God's wisdom for sexual relations, thinking that you're different than all humans and that you're going to avoid the consequences of God's fixed order called wisdom. So the issue is not head knowledge. We know adultery is bad. The issue is our flesh and our battle with sin that tempts us to do what? Tempts us to ignore, dumb down the calls of wisdom that would say, you're veering off the path. Come back to this path. Don't do that. We just ignore those things. We reject God's wisdom, continue to sin, and blind ourselves to the fact that we're taking little steps every day closer and closer to the trap called adultery. It's a trap. You're getting lured. It will close its jaws around you, and you'll wake up and say, what have I done? How did I get here? Those little steps. Proverbs 5 teaches that one way to listen to wisdom and guard ourselves from sin is to consider the end of an action. So look at verses three through six. The lips of a forbidden woman woman drip honey and her speech is smoother than oil, but she's as bitter as wormwood. Those honey lips, they're gonna leave a bitter taste in your mouth. An unpleasant aftertaste will sear your conscience. Verse four, she's sharp as a two-edged sword. You want to go after that woman? You may as well take a sword and stab yourself. You think those lips look nice? Go get a sword and stab yourself. That's what it's going to feel like after you kiss those lips. Verse 5, her feet go down to death. Her steps follow the path to Sheol. That sounds wonderful, right? Remember the end of your actions. Verse 6, she does not ponder the path of life. If you're even near her, what are you doing? What path are you on? She's not even thinking about the path of life. She's a wanderer and is not even aware of it. Jump down with me to verse 9. All right, we'll begin in verse 8. Keep your way far from her. Do, don't, do not go near the door of her house. Why? Lest you give your honor to others, your years to the merciless. Lest strangers take their fill of your strength and lest your labors go to the house of a foreigner. You're going to give your honor, your years, your strength, your labors to other. If you're playing with the fire of adultery or have committed adultery, you're giving your best years, your honor, your money, the years you ought to be investing with your own family and your kids. You're squandering them, paying for porn subscriptions and prostitutes and meals with someone other than your spouse and paying for hotel rooms, hush money or child support. That's the end of that path. Think where it leads. Don't just look at the first step right there. Where's this path going? Consider the end of your actions. 
All that strength, all that labor that ought to be going into your home, you're squandering to another. And within God's inescapable fixed order, the consequence of giving your body belongs to your spouse to another is that your wealth, your money and vitality will now be given to another. Look at verse 11 and he continues. What else is the end of this? The end of your life, you groan. A friend was telling me this morning about somebody he knows that has ruined two marriages through adultery and now describes the end of his days as clinically depressed. He's groaning. This is an inescapable, fixed, moral order. Is that how you want the end of your life to be? Think about that. What do you want the end of your life to be? I want to be sitting on a porch swing, if we have a porch swing, holding the hand of my spouse. Yes, we've had difficulties. Yes, we've made mistakes. Yes, we've been through trials, but we're still together. We're committed to one another, and by God's grace, we still love one another. We've forgiven one another. We praise one another for how we've grown, and we reflect on a life that we didn't deserve, and we praise our maker. Do you have an end in sight that you want? Or do you want the end of your life to be divorced or maybe still legally married, but you're functionally not operating as a married couple? You despise each other. You harbor bitterness against one another. You lord it over the other person, thinking all your problems are because of them. You've got kids with other people. You've got entangled and messed up relationships. You're a baby's daddy or a baby's mama because of a one night stand. You've got less money than you would have had and your retirement is less secure. You've zero trust with your spouse because of your own actions. You might still have a hand, but it's scarred because you stuck it in the fire. Is that, is, is that what you want? Think of the end, church, of your actions. You can't change the past And so you groan in your old age. Why did I do that? I didn't listen to wisdom. I thought I was special. I thought I would escape the inescapable fixed order of God's wisdom in the world. But here I am, unable to rewind time, unable to change the path I went down, and I'm just groaning with how my life has turned out. But the wise father in Proverbs, he contrasts this end with the apparent present pleasure. This forbidden woman, her lips drip honey. There's an immediate allure. It looks good. It tastes good. This is how temptation works. And you have to know that before your foot is in the trap, before you're caught. You have to know this ahead of time. If it's offering immediate gratification and temptation will suppress our ability in that moment to then think of the long-term consequences. We give in to temptation and are fools. We're living in the moment without thinking about how this will affect tomorrow or thinking of the short-lived poison of illicit pleasure and not the guaranteed bitter aftertaste. And so in our sane moments, we have to train ourselves for when temptation comes. If, someone's, if, like, if someone said to you, for one night, I'm going to give you the best experience, the highest joys you've ever had. I mean, it's going to completely ruin your life. It'll create relational nightmares like you couldn't even fathom. It's going to sap your joy entirely, take a lot of your money, and you're going to groan pretty much daily until the end of your life. Do we have a deal? That's how stupid adultery is, and we need to be reminded of that. And so if you want to follow wisdom and flourish In marital faithfulness, consider the end of your actions. Secondly, following wisdom to flourish in marital faithfulness, stay away from the strange woman. I'll explain that word in a minute. Now look at verse 8. Keep your way far from her. I mean, those are all one-syllable words. I told you this passage is not difficult. This is 101 on how to not commit adultery with a temptress. Stay away from her. If you are not near her, it is biologically impossible that you will commit adultery. Stay away. Stay away. And I need to explain this word that's translated here, um, forbidden in verse 3, for the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey. It literally means strange. And when we use the word strange in English, we often think it, it means odd. Something's odd, right? But this word simply means something other than your own. It's something that is foreign to you. It is strange to you. It doesn't belong to you. Thus, in this passage, we get appropriate translations, forbidden, illicit, 
adulterous woman, but literally it means any woman who is not your own spouse. If you are not united in a covenant relationship by marriage, then the individual is to be considered strange, not odd, but strange, other than yours to you. Now, not all women who are not your wife are walking around with lips dripping with honey. Not every woman who is not your wife is a temptress. Scripture teaches elsewhere that we should treat younger women in the faith as sisters. And nobody walks around as if their sister is a temptress. I get that. And yet, while not all women who are not your wife are walking around with lips dripping honey, you might be looking upon other women who are not your wife as if desiring, wishing her lips were dripping with honey. You might be lusting in your heart after her when you ought to be treating her as a sister. My point is simply this. While this passage certainly is primarily speaking about the woman who is acting as a temptress, she's out to seduce. You should stay far away from her. My point is simply that there are still some other things you ought not to do with someone who's not your wife, someone who is strange to you. And the reason I'm stressing this is I've been around long enough to hear multiple stories of people not engaging with a seductive prostitute, but with that friend at work, that friend even at GCG or church. And the relationship turns into something it shouldn't. So clearly, at the very least, when it says, keep your way far from her in verse 8, that means don't look at porn. Don't go to brothels. Don't go to strip clubs. Don't pay for a prostitute. Even if you have that inappropriately flirty neighbor, don't offer to mow her lawn when her husband's out of town. If you're doing these things, you're a fool. Stop. You have a new master and you can stop. You have been set free. The one who is in you is the stronger than the one who's in the world. Did Jesus die for nothing? You have been set free. We sing, my chains are gone. Believe it. Live it. Walk in that freedom. Stop going near her house. It's just a little step. It's fine. I can handle it. I'm a mature Christian. Stop it. But few people who actually commit adultery wake up and think, hmm, I'm going to commit adultery today. Rather, there's these small, unwise decisions made day by day over the course of months to years that then result in the adultery being committed. And because they're small actions, the fool will dismiss reproof in this moment. Blowing it off is not a big deal. But to avoid adultery, you need to realize that it is a snare. It is a trap which will catch you. You don't control traps. They're out to get you. And so as you make unwise decision after unwise decision, you're walking towards that trap and you need to recognize the signs of when you're being lulled into a trap and turn and run. And this is where sadly, not among a lot, all Christians, but sometimes you, you run into a little bit of disagreement. Everybody agrees that adultery is wrong. We agree that I don't want to commit adultery. I don't want my spouse to commit adultery. But when you suggest, hey, you, you've been telling me you've been having lunch with Stacy, you know, your work colleague, you know, once a week, just you two at, you know, the, the food court. Oh no, that seems like a, you know, good idea. And you're a, you're a legalist. I don't want to be a legalist. I want to avoid making rules where the Bible doesn't make rules, but I want to offer wisdom. And to remember, wisdom is that which recognizes the way things work and responds accordingly so that you would walk on pleasant paths. The goal is to walk in pleasantness. And so if you're doing things with someone other than your spouse and they somewhat resemble the way you and your spouse might have dated, texting a lot, a lot of meals together, thinking about them a lot, you know, side hugs a lot for a lingering moment, simply enjoying their presence a lot, you probably have a problem. They could be a coworker, fellow church member, but you text them a lot, you seek them out a lot when you're together, you've got a lot of time with them and you find their company very pleasurable. What's the problem, Johnny? We're just friends. I'd offer that the way the world seems to work, according to God's wisdom, as I have observed it, you're developing a relationship with this person that is unique and special and way beyond normal friendship. A type of relationship that typically ends up in dating and then marriage. And so the problem is, you're already married. You shouldn't be cultivating this type of relationship with another person. 
As Proverbs 6 puts it, can a man carry fire next to his chest and not get burned? This is just the way things work. This fixed wisdom that he's established, specifically how relationships work. You're playing with fire, saying you're not going to get burned, but you were made in the image of your creator, designed for relationships. And the way he made this world, you are designed to have a unique and sexually intimate relationship with one person of the opposite sex in a covenant of marriage. You're also designed to have multiple other relationships, such as friends and family. And while there's a variety in the nature of these relationships, you don't get to make up the rules entirely. There are some cross-cultural boundaries of what is appropriate and inappropriate within each type of relationship. Marriage relationships operate within marriage boundaries. Familial relationships operate within familial boundaries. Friendship relationships operate within friendship boundaries. Everybody seems to know when you're dating that someone has put you in the friend zone, but when we get married, some of us think we can do with our friends things that really belong in the marriage zone. And we think these friends will just stay friends. I'm not going to spend time listing out examples of these, but I think you know what I'm talking about. A good one example of this has recently been dubbed the Billy Graham rule, whereby he, Billy Graham, would not have dinner with any other female other than his wife. Some people assume when you have such boundaries that you're either a very weak, immature Christian who's tempted all the time and needs boundaries to protect yourself from a fall, or you have a demeaning view of women in that you can't imagine treating them as full human beings, seeing them as nothing but a potential hindrance to your purity, something in creation you must, must continually shield your eyes from. So let's address each of these objections in turn. I think wisdom would say, that's the way the world works. If you carry fire next to your chest, you will get burned. This has nothing to do with being an immature or a mature Christian. All types of Christians, the most mature and the most immature, will get burned if you carry fire. Your maturity has nothing to do with your ability to get burned. And rather, to the contrary, it's usually the, wisdom, the wise and the mature who will heed wisdom and say, oh, if I keep carrying that next to my chest, I'll probably get burned, so I'm not going to carry that next to my chest. And it's the immature who say, well, I, could, I, could, I could carry that. I'll, I'll be fine. I, that, that doesn't tempt me. I'm a strong Christian. So specifically, when it comes to spending an increased amount of time alone with someone of the opposite sex who's not your spouse, wisdom would say this is the way the world works, our relationships are cultivated, and you were made for one unique and special relationship. And if you're spending extended periods of time with somebody else, not your spouse, you are cultivating a unique and special relationship with someone, not your spouse, and you shouldn't do that. Let me address the second point, that, that, that such a posture is demeaning to women. I disagree with this. It's not that you're viewing all women as temptresses. Rather, it's treating all women other than your spouse, recognizing they are strange, again, to use that biblical term. There are relational things, not just sex, that only your wife ought to get, your spouse ought to get. And it's not demeaning that you don't give those things to other women. It's honoring to your spouse. It's recognizing this is the way things work, and that most adulteries will happen in the context of spending a lot of time together alone with someone not your spouse, the need that you have for this type of relationship, you're satisfying it in the wrong direction when you should be directing it towards your spouse. So in as much as you have a relationship with a sister, this is what your relationship with other Christian women must be like. It's not demeaning, but honoring, because there's no hint of sexual impropriety. You encourage one another as brother and sister, but you don't conduct yourself in such a way that would be moving those in the friend zone into the married zone when you're already married. And lastly, if you want to follow wisdom and flourish in marital faithfulness, get utterly drunk on the love of your spouse. This is not a difficult passage, as I've said. Stay away from the temptress, and get really close to your wife. Look in verse 18, or sorry, verse 15. Drink and, 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 and look at how your, your spouse, your wife, is contrasted with the strange woman. Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the street, let them be for yourself alone and not 
for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Are you getting the point? Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated, drunk, led astray always in her love. And after you read all that, then this verse 20, why would you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? There is an exclusivity to marital relations which includes sexual intimacy limited to two people within the covenant of marriage. This is God's good, fixed order and will result in your flourishing if you continue to walk in it. It's not an outdated, antiquated way of doing sex, as our culture would say, mocking people as those who don't try before they buy. This is God's wisdom. This is how it works. And if you obey the Lord, you'll walk in pleasantness. Look at verse 18. Let your fountain be blessed. Something that is blessed is something that is under the favor of God. Do you want your marriage to be blessed? Do you want God to look on it and bless it? Then follow the wisdom that this passage is saying. Now, some churches, they function as if sex is a dirty word and we shouldn't talk about it in church, but it was designed by God. He, as creator, decided the details of how it's going to work. This creation is very good, and everything in it was created by a kind and good God for our enjoyment, including sex, so that we would praise and thank our maker. But our culture has hijacked it and perverted it, making it into a host of things that it ought not to be. Just as eating too much is a sin, and yet food is still a good gift from God, perverting and twisting sex from its original design is a sin, but embracing it as it was created to be enjoyed as part of God's good fixed wisdom and order is a gift from our maker. So look at these three commands in verse 18 and 19. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight and be intoxicated in her love. So in as much as scripture says, don't steal, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, Ephesians would say, and share with those that have a need, it commands us, rejoice in your wife. Be delighted in her physical appearance at all times and always get drunk on her love. These are commands. They're not passive things. This is important. Your wife here is not commanded to be delightable, easy to rejoice in. Rather, within this exclusive sexual relationship, you are to cultivate a rejoicing in your wife, being delighted in her physical appearance and being intoxicated with her love. And this is a problem for many of you because you've unwittingly embraced the standards and principles of the culture for how your marriage should work and what you should be delighted in. You want your wife to act a certain way and look a certain way and want her to be intoxicating like somebody else but you're ignoring the uniqueness of your wife, that she's yours and no one else's. And meditating on this, the exclusivity of your covenant union will go a long way to making it easier for you to rejoice, be delighted in and intoxicated by your wife. The primary reason you are to cultivate delighting in your wife in her physical appearance and in her love is not because she scores high on some external standard, but precisely because she is yours by covenant, yours by vows, yours by commitment. Now let me explore a probably terrible analogy for a moment that I hope will renew our minds into understanding what this passage is saying. So playing on the analogy of Solomon's metaphor of intoxication, getting drunk off your wife's love. Imagine someone said, Stay with me. Let your home-brewed beer fill you at all times with delight. And if you said, I'm, I'm trying, I'm really trying, but man, it's a lot easier for that store-bought stuff. It's got higher quality. Then you're misunderstanding entirely what Solomon is saying. You're objectively comparing a beer to a beer based on external factors. You're completely ignoring the exclusive context in which the beer is produced this, the beer is brewed locally, at home, for you. 
Yes, you are to delight in the beer itself, but that delight, stay with me, supremely surpasses all other beers because of the context in which it was made. So when it says, let her breasts delight you at all times and be intoxicated always in her love, the accent isn't on breasts or lovemaking. You're delighting in her breasts and in her love, but the delight is in unsurpassable on human terms because they're hers. It's her love. And she's yours by covenantal union. The exclusivity of her body and her love being reserved for you within a covenantal context of marriage is what makes the delighting of your wife incomparable, really and truly, to other temptations. You ought to be delighting in the fact that you can be naked and unashamed with the one who has vowed to be with you in sickness and in health, for better or for worse, until death do you part. You're delighting in the fact that she's not sharing her body with anyone else. It's hers and she gives it only to you. The hands that you get to hold are the hands that have rocked your children. And her lips that you get to kiss are the same lips that you've enjoyed decades of conversing with. Her body which you embrace is the same body she, by God's grace, uses to sacrificially serve you and others. This makes the love of your wife supremely and incomparably delightable, uniquely so to you. This is objective beauty. Objective beauty uniquely designed for you. And you do not find such beauty in your wife desirable. If you don't, it's because your mind has been trained by the world standards of beauty and you need to repent and meditate on what is truly beautiful and lovely. Now the passage does say you're to be delighted in her physical beauty at all times. This doesn't necessarily mean literally every second of the day. Though, other than the fact that you'll be terrible at accomplishing other tasks, I don't really see anything wrong with that. But more specifically, it focuses on the fact that you'll be delighted in her appearance in all seasons. When she's young and when she's old, every season in between. And when her body goes through those multiple changes and possibly bears multiple scars, you're to delight in that body. Your covenantal relationship means you've been with her though through those years. She's the wife of your youth, whether she's still a youth or not. And I won't give a cutoff date. The bodily changes she has gone through They're a memory of a life lived together in covenantal faithfulness, and you get to delight in that. And so in verse 20, when it compares that kind of love to the embracing and intoxication of a strange woman, you should see the utter folly in that. How could you even compare these two things? Why on earth would you embrace a strange woman? Why would that be intoxicating to you? If you're renewing your mind to see the good, true, and beautiful aspect of faithful covenantal marriage that is a gift that you've received, long life together with the same person, which includes your own exclusive enjoyment of sexual relations together, to embrace this strange woman should seem repulsive. If you're meditating on those things, what on earth am I doing? What? The love of your wife ought to be not even to be compared to that way you get to get drunk on the love of your wife is so much better than you could compare. Solomon, who wrote Proverbs and wrote the Song of Solomon, he concludes the Song of Solomon saying this, if a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. You can buy a prostitute or a porn subscription, but you cannot buy this covenantal love And this includes the incomparable delights of the physical intimacy that occurs within that context. You could go through the motions with a strange woman, but it's not real love. The wisdom of God would say it's not even compared. He's offering you something better. And you're a fool if you seek to get intoxicated with a strange woman. So if you want to follow wisdom and flourish in marital faithfulness, get utterly drunk on the love of your spouse remembering that it is uniquely and exclusively for you to enjoy. And let me conclude with a couple of words to various people. This is how Solomon speaks to his dad, uh, Solomon speaks to his sons. So if you're a dad and you're not speaking like this to your son, you ought to be. If you're some, if someone has committed adultery against you, broken covenant with you, 
And though you're blameless in that specific sin and you bear some of those consequences, I want to remind you of the one who will never leave you or forsake you. All earthly marriages are imperfect. but They're meant to show us what our union with God will be like and that union will last forever. If someone's abandoned you, he will not abandon you. Throughout wives, I have tried to say the word spouse, uh, but the sermon, so that the sermon applies to you also, and certainly by implication it does. You ought to pursue faithfulness by avoiding tempting man and getting drunk off the covenantal love provided by God through your husband. But you might wonder why this passage is addressed to a son. Well, first, it's not to any son. It's to a royal son. It's to the king. God made a promise that the whole world would be blessed through a coming son of David who would obey all of God's righteous commands. Male or female, we all need a righteous king to save us. And male or female, our righteous king is our example. And so the instruction in this passage does apply to women by implication as they look to their king's example of fidelity. And ultimately, they point this passage to the son of David who has saved us because of his exclusive covenantal fidelity and love to his bride, the church. And lastly, if you've committed adultery, sin has consequences. And I can't promise that you won't bear those earthly consequences, possibly to your deathbed. But I can promise that if you repent You can rise up and get out of the grave because you are forgiven. You can have this guilt taken away by the blood of Jesus. But if you're living in unrepentant adultery, right now that path will lead to death. But confess your sins and be forgiven and receive the gift of eternal life. I've seen Christians commit adultery by fooling around with someone at work, running off with other Christians, even pastors and pastor's wives. And when I look at you all, I fear to think, who's next? And so I pray that you all will follow wisdom and flourish in marital faithfulness by considering the end of your actions, staying away from the strange woman, and getting utterly drunk in the love of your spouse. Let's pray. Lord, open our eyes to see what is true and beautiful, to love what is true and beautiful, to thank you for the good gifts you've given us, to fight the good faith against temptation to slay our flesh and kill it by your word. We need your help and your grace to keep us to that last day. Would you keep all of the marriages in this room? Let there not be a next in this room, Lord. Keep all of us, I pray, for your glory, that our lives would show a world, a world that is so perverted and messed up, what covenantal love ought to be and how we can receive it through Jesus. Jesus.